We've talked about preparing guide planes to dictate a single path of insertion for a removable partial denture and how important those guiding planes are. That's important to give us some frictional retention and also to limit the amount of undercut that our metal flexible clasps go into. Your guiding planes will be more effective uh, if they're parallel to each other. That stands to reason. But they're also more effective if you place them on more than one surface. If you place them on the mesial surface of this molar and the distal surface of this uh, canine as well as on the lingual surfaces of the molars. All those different surfaces help dictate that single path of insertion more easily. It's also important that if you have some guiding planes that directly oppose each other, like you see right here, those are going to be more effective than if you just have guiding planes that do not oppose each other. Here's a case where we've got a cane on one side and a premolar on the other. The mesial guide plane on the premolar is pointing in this direction slightly forward. The guiding plane on this canine is pointing in this direction here. They're not opposing each other directly, they won't give as much frictional retention as the last case we saw. Two other factors will influence how effective your guide planes are. The more teeth that you have guiding planes on, let's say this molar, this canine, this premolar, this molar, the more surfaces involved, the greater frictional retention you'll have and the more effective your guide planes are. And lastly, the larger the surface area on each of those guide planes, the more effective the guide planes. Remember when you first selected your path of insertion on your diagnostic cast, you were proposing a selected path of insertion. Once you've actually done the preparations interorally, that proposed path of insertion is now an actual path of insertion, and that path of insertion is dictated by the parallel planes that you made. This is our diagnostic cast. Here's a cast that we've made of our preparations. We've made an alginate impression of the abutment modifications that we've made interorally. We've poured that up in stone, and now we have another cast. This one has our preparations on it. To check how well you've prepared your guiding planes, take one of the teeth with the guiding plane prepared on it and try and get your analyzing rod so that it's almost perfectly parallel with the guiding plane on that surface. You'll have to do that on the proximal surface and if you prepared lingual or, or buccal guiding planes, you'll have to check that as well. So line that up as best as you can. Then move over to one of the other teeth and make sure things are fairly parallel. You can see here, when we've lined up our molar so that it's perfectly parallel, this premolar looks pretty good. The height of contour is down low. We've got a fairly wide guide plane. You can see that there's a little bit of space between the analyzing rod and the tooth at the, at the occlusal surface. That means this guiding plane is slightly divergent, but we don't have an undercut. You can sometimes get fooled that your guiding planes aren't as good as they actually are. Here's one that I've lined up. But again, I've left a little bit of space up here at, toward the occlusal surface, so it's not perfectly parallel with my guide plane I prepared on that tooth. If I look at the back tooth, even though this is the same cast with the same preparations, it looks like I need to do more preparation on the mesial surface of the molar. The problem is, I don't have this tilted properly. So what I would do again is tilt my cast till I get that just about perfect, and then I'd make sure that things lined up and things look good. You can tell if you don't have your cast with your preparations tilted properly if you've got two opposing guide planes. Here you can see on the distal surface of the premolar, it looks like my height of contour is right down at the gingival margin. But on the opposing side, it looks like the height of contour is right at my marginal ridge. That's not good. That's not even. What I need to do is tilt this a little bit more. I should be able to, if I line this up so that it's perfectly parallel, I will see that I have a very broad marking on my guiding plane. When I go to mark my other tooth on the opposite side, you'll see that my height of contour also goes down much lower. How do you measure the height of your guiding plane? You measure from the marginal ridge on a proximal surface down to the lowest part of the line of the height of contour. This is my initial marking when I had it tilted improperly. So I, that's right at my marginal ridge. So if I take a look from my marginal ridge down to here, 
I have about a three or four millimeter guide plane. Underneath my rest seat, I've got about two millimeters. Over here, again about two millimeters, and then it goes a little bit lower over here. When you mark your guiding planes with your carbon markers, mark them very lightly. You don't want to break the lead and you don't want to make it too dark. This is a, the markings for a guide plane that is almost perfect. We can tell it's almost perfect because it has a broad mark from the bottom to the top all the way across and we've got that good three four millimeters of guide plane height. If we look at it from the side from the buckle surface you can see that it's almost perfectly parallel with our analyzing rod or carbon mark or whatever we've used. Here's a guiding plane that's acceptable but it's not perfect. You can see there's a little bit of gap up toward the occlusal surface but if we take a look on the proximal surface you can see we've got again from the marginal ridge area two to four millimeters of height. Watch it at these corners mesial buccal corners, uh, mesial lingual corners, all those proximal corners. You can see the height of contour coming up here and it's getting very minimal up here. You want to round that corner and make sure that height of contour stays low. Here's a height of contour that's unacceptable. Here's our marginal ridge and our line is right at the marginal ridge. That means we don't have a guide plane. You can see it stays high all the way around here till it spikes at the corner and then as we've gone around the corner we've actually lowered the height of contour so that it's quite a bit lower right in this area here. This part's okay but this part's too high. If you see that your height of contour is at the marginal ridge you don't have a guide plane. You may either have to change your tilt to see if you can line that up a little bit better or if you can't do that for all of your preparations you may have to go back and do some adjustments intraorally. For toothborne cases this is what we'd like to see. Longer guide planes. There's not as much rotation on a class 3 or a class 4 a toothborne removable partial denture. Those can have very large guide planes without causing torquing of the teeth. For distal extension cases, we still want a two to four millimeter guide plane, but we want to keep some space, some triangular space down at the bottom so that there's some place for the partial denture to rotate in. And we'll talk about why that's important later. The main principle is for distal extension cases, class one and class two, make sure your guide plane doesn't go all the way down to the free gingival margin. You still need two to four millimeters height for your guide plane, but you don't want to go on all the way to the free gingival margin.